if you're going to take a stand for something, you've got to be standing on something pretty solid. You stand on your values. Hello, everybody. You're back on the Faculty Factory podcast, and I'm Kim Skorupski here at Hopkins, and I am looking at Dr. Chip Shoba. Hi, Chip. Hi, Kim. Well, we are really, really excited to bring Chip to you today because I remember taking a workshop from Chip Shoba at the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges in Washington, D.C., maybe three, four years ago, and being so impressed with the way you think the way you engaged with us, the way you prompted us to kind of sit in some discomfort and think about tough things. And so when our professor here, Dr. Rachel Salas, professor of neurology who does sleep disorders, and she's a frequent flyer on the podcast, said, hey, I've been uh, taking this session and working with uh, Chip Shoba. And I said, I know that guy. And she said, I think he'd be great on the podcast. Get him to talk about inward journey." So, of course, I jumped all over that email, and here you are, Chip. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining the podcast. We're starting year four of it. So we've got an international audience of leaders in academic medicine and faculty members in academic medicine. So will you please tell everybody who you are and what you do at Dartmouth, and then let's get into Inward Journey. Sure. Thanks, Kim. Uh, Thanks for having me uh, today. So I'm on the faculty uh, at Dartmouth, I'm actually I'm a professor of surgery, a former uh, medical school dean at Dartmouth, and prior to that, a medical school dean at uh, Ohio State. But all of those administrative kinds of duties have now been passed off to others, and uh, so I'm kind of enjoying time in the latter half of my career to think about the very issues that you uh, just brought up. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, this is really, I think the perfect timing and I, and I love how things come together in life and synergize so perfectly. A lot of our faculty are stressed. They're up against the wall. We're just fatigued beyond measure. Uh, A lot of faculty members feeling hopeless, like wondering where is the promise of academic medicine what about my life and building a family and getting these papers and grants and generating RVUs? And then leaders are dealing with insufficient resources and budgets and concern about turnover and recruiting and retention and diversity. Talk to us about inward journey and how we can find some wisdom um, through this process. Yeah, so the, the, the notion is not especially mysterious. I mean, it, I, I, it sort of starts with the premise that the one person that you lead all the time in your life is yourself. You, you may not be aware of it, but uh, you are leading yourself virtually every moment of the day. Uh, and we call it the inward journey of leadership because it involves going inward, in a sense, and exploring who you are. It's a journey because it's, we like to say it's a lifelong endeavor. It's a mountain with no top. And uh, uh, it's about leadership because it's about um, leading yourself uh, such that you can experience more joy, I would say, and more fulfillment in life but also leading yourself is the prerequisite to being an effective leader of others. Mm. And um, so um, we would say you've got to start with yourself and the best leaders are those who are in touch with themselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. Chip, where does this go wrong? You know, being a Dean to prestigious institutions and doing obviously surgery, high intense, high focus, and a lot of teamwork required and pressure, where I'm sure you've seen many instances where this leadership goes awry when people have not 
spend some time starting with self. Can you think of a couple examples that listeners can say, okay, now I know I get what he's talking about. When someone is not in touch with themselves, but they're in a leadership role, where does that go wrong? What does that look like? Yeah, I, I, I you know, I've seen it uh, many times as uh, you probably have as well. Um, I think the, 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 it's important to understand that the system, and when I use the word system, I'm not using it derogatorily, but the, the whole system that we grow up with, not just the system of academic medicine or medicine more broadly, but our entire socialization into society, particularly in the West, um, our entire enculturation uh, is very, um, it stresses the importance of achieving for oneself. Um, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, you know, you got your medical degree, no one else got it for you. You got your grants. Uh, you may have had some help, but you're at the end of the day, wrote your grants. And, you know, we live in a system um, where there's enormous emphasis on performance, doing, acting, um, achieving, competing. Um, in and of themselves, those things are fine, but uh, what's often missing is some sort of fundamental foundation that underpins or uh, serves as a bedrock, you know, for what we do and what we know. And so the idea here is that you want to start with what does it mean to be a physician? What does it mean to be a leader rather than jumping immediately into what leaders do, what leaders know, what physicians do, what physicians know? You know, they know a lot and they do a lot, but the doing, the exercise of leadership can get uh, off kilter, off track when there's not a fu fundamental grounding in what it means to be a leader. Now, you push this a step further, and uh, the way I would say it is leaders, the best leaders must be committed to a future that's bigger than their own agenda. And I think, you know, one of the ways that you can get off track, particularly given the socialization uh, that we find ourselves immersed in, uh, it's inevitable, is that it's all about me, it's all about achieving, and the sort of being of leadership, you know, being committed to something bigger than myself, being authentic, being in integrity, those things can go by the wayside. And we don't just see this in medicine, we, medicine, we see it in all types of organization. This, there's so many um, components to this. And, you know, of course, I think right off the bat with about emotional intelligence and the way we think teach leadership and start off our leadership courses here at Hopkins has to do with this, the Socratic principle, know thyself to better manage thyself. And once we know ourselves, better manage ourselves, we can then look outward to knowing others and managing those relationships. And I remember learning from you this concept of like putting different frames and different lenses on things and, and looking things from different perspectives and that can you talk a little bit about you know shifting focus and how that might help illuminate some dark corners of ourselves and others yeah sure um so you know one of the things that uh, we try to get people to um discover um and everything we teach is in an attempt to get people to discover things for themselves. Don't, you know, discover it yourself. Don't take my word for it. But one of the things that, that you can discover is, is that all of your uh, mental models, your frames of reference, your lenses, all of those kinds of things uh, emanate from the narratives that we all assemble beginning at 
quite a young age. And, uh, um, you know, we all have our individual narratives, but there are some big meta narratives that human beings share. The most common of which we believe is this story that bounces around in our head that says, I'm not good enough. Hmm. I'm not smart enough. I'm not, you know, um, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't get enough attention. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, I'm not slim enough. Mm -hmm. All of those, th those are, those meta narratives are part and parcel of, of being human. And the, the, the work that we do involves helping people understand where those stories come from because they don't exist when you're a, a toddler. All you need to do is watch little children and there's nothing there in their interactions, in their play that suggests they're not good enough. They're, they're just perfect the way they are. Yeah. Uh, so, so these, this, this sort of meta narrative that says I'm, I'm not good enough is um, something that, we try to get people to, to work through because you can imagine if you're in a leadership position and you're not good enough, you're going to do everything you can achieve everything you can amass every title that you can in order to convince yourself and others that you're good enough. And, you know, it's a ladder with no top because you're never good enough. You know, I'm, I'm a good example of that for a long time. I define myself by my CV, my resume, yeah. um, and that's what made me good enough. And uh, I, it dawned on me, I guess, uh, fortunately, a number of years ago, that um, that was a future that was no bigger than me. It was only about me. Yeah. And um, most of us can discover that there's something. Uh, about only focusing on yourself that lacks joy, I guess. It lacks um, equanimity. And uh, so I think one of the big transitions that leaders make is when they discover that it's not about them. It's about the organization, even if they, you know, even to their peril, that you, it's about, taking a stand for other people. Yeah. And uh, the only way you're going to do that is to work through, we like to say, rewrite that story that you concocted when you were a child that said you weren't good enough. Yeah. Me, me, me is dull, dull, dull. Yeah. I love in the yeah. piece you wrote for the Pharaohs in autumn 2021, you quote, uh, you're so... I just again, I love how you think, but you you talk about Oscar Wilde reminding us that most people are other people. Their thoughts right. are someone else's opinions. Their lives yeah. a mimicry. Their passions a quotation. And that really makes me think of when you're talking about our life stories. How do we create? Who wrote the life story? And to remind ourselves to take back the pen. And is our life story really ours or is it coming from some other person directing what they think our life should be or what we should study, where we should go, what we should focus on, what our residency, what our fellowship should be, where we should live, what we should wear, who we should marry and on and on and on. And that, that sometimes tough downward inward journey can be difficult because sometimes we can realize that, yeah, where's my passion and joy? When do, when is a part of the story where I get to live my life? So, yeah, right. go on, go on. I'll let you t take it up from there. But I loved how you put that in the piece. Well, I think you know if you just if you, it's inevitable that we're going to be socialized to to a significant extent. I mean, um, and the the there are a number of uh, aspects of being enculturated and uh, conventionalized, if you will, that are 
are, are necessary. And, you know, you have to have a point of view. And I always tell people, if you didn't have a frame of reference, it would take you forever to order a meal off a menu. <laughs> We all have frames of reference. Well, I think I'll get fish because last night I had steak and that sort of thing. Um, but it's really about getting comfortable with yourself in spite of your all, all your vulnerabilities and weaknesses and uh, peccadillos. You know, we all have them. And, um, you know, if you're if you spend your whole life trying to live up to the expectations of others. Um, and, you know, it starts with our parents. I always, I always tried to keep in mind that um, you don't want your kids to be the athlete you never were. Mm -hmm. And you got to let them do their, do their own thing and, 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 and find their, their own way. You talk in, in the piece also about, and I, and I remember this exercise of values that at that event, we had a big card deck and we were given and given a fair amount of time to ascertain our personal values, the, the values that we always value most of the time, sometimes seldom and never. Right. And I remember that exercise and you had given us a long time to do it. And I remember thinking, are you kidding me? I can do this in a minute. But after I rolled my eyes and kind of got over my my obnoxious self, I, I really got into it. And it really, to this day now, I still, I lead with values. And it sounds so touchy-feely, soft and squishy and all that kind of stuff. But boy, does it really get one to dig deep of, wow, if these are my top five most important values, but my mission statement is here. And now I have this misaligned life. Um, no wonder I'm feeling burnout. No wonder I'm feeling disengaged and um, living this incongruous life, incongruent life, because I, I'm thinking, you know, this cognitive dissonance that I want this, but I'm acting that way. So can you talk a little bit more about the spirituality component of the inward journey? Yeah, we think, you know, um, the, the, the term spirituality is it's kind of a loaded word, right? It's, it can be a flashpoint for people. But um, what I would say is every, everybody has a spirituality in the sense that everybody looks ultimately to some guiding force, to some fundamental principle that they defer to when things get really, really difficult. And, and, and that's your spirituality. And, and if somebody says, well, I don't defer to anything, then I, I say that that doesn't mean you don't have spirituality. That, that is your spirituality. That's the way in which you make choices and decisions. Um, and, and so you, it's important, I think, for people to get in touch with that, or at least to test it, check it out. Because, uh, as you said, if your values are um, fragile, um, you won't have a strong foundation upon which to lead. And, uh, you know, the first time that you're faced with a very difficult problem, you'll be the first to throw in the towel and throw up your hands. Right. right. And so. Uh, to your point, uh, values are critical. And so, for example, you we could start by saying, what does it mean to be a leader? Not, not what do leaders do? We know what they do. But what does it mean to be a leader? And if you get people to chew on that for a while, they will invariably come up that with the idea that, well, to be a leader means to be committed. Now, we would say to be committed to a future bigger than yourself, right? To be a leader is to be authentic. And so when you ask that question, what does it mean to be a leader? What does it mean to be a parent? What, what does it mean to be a teacher? What does it mean to be a physician? As soon as you make those choices, 
and you have your set of values, you've, you've got constraints. So values clearly put constraints around the way we can behave, right? The values of an organization presumably define the way in which people will live together as they create the future. So their values are clearly um, creating constraints, but, but, but what you'll find is that what they give you is, is a freedom, not from constraints, but a freedom within constraints. And that's a very important thing for people to, to grasp because most people think freedom is I can do anything I want to. But real freedom is about having the freedom to be and the freedom to act within constraints. We're going to be free to be and act without being inauthentic. Genius. This is like mind-blowing paradoxical stuff. But I remember when I first met you, I'm like, this guy is like a genius. How can both of these things coexist? How can we talk about constraints and freedom and freedom and constraints? But you're making me think of something somebody told me back in graduate school. I was taking a marriage and family course. And the professor said something like, you know, freedom. It sounds great. But those of you who have children or will have children, freedom, complete freedom is scary. It's dangerous. A child who'd have no boundaries, no borders, complete normlessness, lawlessness, that sounds like, oh, great, what a free for all, I'm free, I'm free. It can be terrifying and dangerous because the, there are no boundaries or, or um, borders or invisible walls, if you will, that you feel a certain amount of safety in that to know that I'm safe here. So that's where you're getting me. You're putting me back to that idea that kind of blew my mind. And just like you blew my mind years ago. And just saying that again, that does it. That while we all want to be free and academic freedom is a guiding principle and a promise of academic medicine, the constraints are both good and bad. So we can, we can talk about this a, a lot about how the nature of the institution build in constraints, but also which can be bad, the constraints can also be good if we are constraining our thoughts and our practices and our behaviors around those guiding principles. So zipping my lip. If you don't, right. I think that's well said, Kim. If you don't have any guiding principles, it's a free for all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, and I think to carry that a step further, we've all seen organizations that espouse certain values but they don't enact them. And that creates enormous resentment, I guess, on the part of the faculty. You know, you say we're going to be team players, but, you know, uh, we're not. And uh, the people with the biggest voice or the biggest practice or the biggest research portfolio, they kind of get a pass. And, and that, that, that is very difficult you know, for faculty to live with. I don't think faculty have, have an issue knowing that certain specialties get paid more than others. But when the, when the, when the, love, when the playing field becomes unlevel because of that violations in the values, that really gets in people's craw. You're right, Chip, because then that, we see through that. Faculty can see through that. Departments can see through that. Schools can see through that. If you slap something on a website that we're all about diversity and inclusion and you don't act as if and actually do the things, it is in, as you saw, said, inauthentic. And then you kind of it erodes that confidence in the purpose and the mission, and then how I fit in a place that's not leading with authenticity. And then that brings it down to the micro level. The same thing with me as a faculty member, if I'm espousing certain values, but not acting them out or living them out in my home or in my clinical practice or in the research lab, that lack of authenticity is also apparent. Other people can see that if, if your kids hear you saying over and over and over again, that, you know, time together is the most value, but you're not doing it. The kids can see through that. So it goes up and down the ladder all through that, that, um, that what we say, and that's why I love what you teach us for this inward journey is being 
taking the time because a lot of people say, well, I don't have time to do this. This is, this is great fluffy talk, but who's got time to do this? But it's almost like when you train someone for a job, if you're going to do a workaround and say, well, they'll pick it up. You're losing a lot of potential gain by not investing the time at the beginning to train someone. So if we don't invest that time and step back in ourselves, we're going to run down that road or up that mountaintop and it's going to be a, a circus because we've not yeah. invested the time. Yeah. And I think one of the things that that we talk about is, is um, to try to get people to play around with this, this idea that that most of us think of ourselves and others as something like a separate object with properties. You know, we've got physical properties that are unique. We've got internal properties, thoughts, feelings, those kinds of things. And we've got properties, properties like a boat or a jet or um, a house or a title or a position. And if if that's the way you live your life, and that certainly seems to be the way that society is endorsing, um, it's not a particularly inspiring paradigm inside of which to be human, hmm. right? Um, so, um, you know, we try to try to get people to start thinking a little bit about, uh, okay, I understand that I've got a body and, and uh, you know, physical and, uh, and the cognitive properties. I understand that. But is there a way, particularly for leaders, to think about themselves a more fundamental way that might give them more power, if you will, make them more effective. And so one of the ways to, to get, get people to start paying attention to this is, um, is, is to think of, of your life. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of truth to this based on the work of the uh, quantum physics people is that you are really energy. If you if you take yourself apart down to the quantum level, it's your your you and I are are a vast network of fields of energy, um, and you know it's it's like a it's like a light bulb or a candle. If you if you put on a light bulb, it's going to emit energy. It, it does so in the form of of light and heat. Um, and, um, um, and so you, you, so it, it has an impact, right? The, the energy extends out from the, from the candle. And if you, if you can start to play around with this notion of, oh, I'm energy and I emit energy and every thought that I have is kind of a form of energy and everything I say has energy to it and every action I take has energy to it and those are emitted. I mean, you know, we all you need to do is we've all been in a room where somebody's behavior or what they say, uh, there's tremendous energy around it and it can be positive or, or negative. Um, but I think it's important for people to begin to chew on this notion that we all emit energy. And what kind of energy do you want to emit? Because, you know, the it's all about me. I'm an object amassing properties. That's a kind of energy that is not uh, particularly, um, it, it doesn't get us where we want to get in terms of you know, being a whole institution whose commitments are, you know, to the very noble things that your, your institution and my institution are committed to. I mean, you know, there's not, I can't imagine of another profession, maybe the ministry, but 
other than medicine where you're where the privilege of connecting with people at the deepest level is a gift. Mm-hmm. And we want to honor that and 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 preserve it and not, you know, not think of others as as medical record numbers or mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Oh, Chip, so profound. The gift. We, we, we are given a gift and we give gifts. I'm wondering if if you have a little bit of time, I'm if you could help me think about something, and that is kind of flipping it around the other way. Two things, flipping around the this quantum physics discussion of we are energy and we emit energy. Can you help me wax poetic about receiving energy and or not necessarily leadership, but followership? So I'm, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the idea that everybody is all about leadership. You know, our institutions have been building programs and and coaching and mentoring around leadership and measuring leadership. And there's not as much about followership. And so I'm, when you started talking about emitting energy, I thought of, you know, how we also absorb energy, negative energy and positive energy and how that amplifies and grows our energy. And then it got me thinking about this idea that I've been noodling around for a couple of years now is, should we be teaching followership? And is there a time and place that while we're all leaders, because by virtue of getting an academic medicine, we're some people view us as leaders, period, hard stop. And we're also followers. So how do we be better followers? Yeah, so I, I, I would say, you know, we're, we're all leaders and followers at the same time. And so, for example, one of the things which... Uh, I think I don't think you can overstress it, it, and I say this to the people I work with all the time is you want to discover for yourself that your moment to moment way of being and acting your moment to moment way of being has a huge impact on those around you huge I mean if if you're with your team and you're being distracted, or if you're being short, that's going to have a big impact on them. And it's, it's inevitable because there's an energy there that is emitted that interacts with their fields. It's inevitable. So uh, if you believe that so-called positive energy, some people say high vibration energy, But if you believe that that makes a difference, what you want to try to do as much as you can is is to shower people with um, the type of energy that will elevate their performance. So, for example, when a group of medical students is on uh, teaching rounds with the attending, if they can experience the attending being compassionate with the patient, they will experience that too, you see. And uh, that's why this whole field of professionalism is, it it really is first and foremost about what kind of mentors do we get to observe in the clinical setting that, you know, in our minds exhibit the very best of, of professionalism. So, um, you know, you want to, you're receiving and giving all the time and uh, um, you want to be aware of that and let uh, people, uh, you know, who, who are ordinarily not seen as, as leaders um, speak their mind, so to speak, because often uh, in what they say, there's an energy there that even the CEO can harness or, you know, benefit from. So I, I am starting to do my, my latest work is, is in this area of, you know, energy. And, uh, you know, I really, 
I mean, you know, it doesn't take a lot of effort to walk around our institutions and you see people that are emitting negative energy and people that are emitting positive energy. And if you go back and you look at the ancient, some of the most ancient writings, um, scripture and so on, they, they talk about people who emitted an energy that was staggering. You know, it's very inspiring to me, you know, to think that an individual could bring that to the table, mm-hmm. to multiply that by many people. Um, there is absolutely nothing in medicine we cannot accomplish. Mm-hmm. It's, such, it's such a core, this idea that you're talking about energy, it's such a core essence of the human condition. And I, and it's so, I love things that are so simple and simultaneously complex. And I can't help but think of just, we've all experienced both sides of this. So we walk out of the house in the morning and it's sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. And I get in my car and I'm singing along and one guy is either on his phone and won't go through the, the light. And so he's holding everybody up or one guy flies the red light and I almost hit him. And there goes my sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. Now it's snails and puppy dog tails and I'm grumbling and grousing. And in that moment with a complete stranger whose energy is 20, 30, 40 feet away from me, that energy, wham, smacks me upside the head. Yeah. Similarly, when I'm all crusty and crunchy and have my knickers in a knot, I can see Chip Shoba coming at me with a smile on his face and just my snarly attitude. I can almost see it yeah. hit you and turn that frown, that smile into a frown. So it's so obvious how our energies collide and marry to be better or to worse. And yet we sometimes fail to see that basic core fundamental essence of humanity and parlay that into our lives and and, and, in our careers. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think that's a a great point. The knowledge and the intelligence to be whole and complete is with us all. It's just veiled. Mm. It it got, it got covered up. Um, during our socialization. And, and uh, I was reading something recently that said, you know, really our job as adults is to rediscover the child that experienced her completeness in, in totality. And, um, um, and I think there's, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of truth to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So thanks for bringing it up. Remember that book? Wasn't it something like everything I learned? I need everything I need to know. I learned in kindergarten. Do you remember? That's a little cute. Yeah, book I do. Like that, and it. Yeah. And I can't help but you know I can see people rolling their eyes listening to this, but geez, there's a lot of truth in that. Just be kind. You know, be nice. Yeah. Be, help help each other out, and then also show a little mercy and grace to ourselves when we act out, and then give that that benefit of the doubt to others when they're having a a rough day. And I think that starting with ourselves and recognizing that if I'm going to give myself a break, let me give somebody else a break. And likewise, if I'm holding myself to such an, you know, high, high bar and wanting to be perfect, people are going to, I'm going to emit that energy and nobody else is ever going to be perfect enough either. So recognizing that inward journey, I mean, that's all that you're talking about, right, Chip? Yeah. And the energy stuff is a little bit, I don't want to say elusive, uh, you know, we really, we don't know what energy is. You know, we, 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 we know what energy does. We know how it interacts with matter and that sort of thing. Um, So, you know, to sort of concretize it and um, in, in a way that, you know, people can gra- grasp it. What, what, and you've heard this. What we like to say is that you want to discover what it is you care about deeply. You know, we call that your stand, right? Maybe it's patient care, maybe it's research, maybe it's uh, 
being the best teacher possible. But whatever you stand for, it has to be about a future bigger than yourself. And um, I like to think of, you know, you've got to, if you're going to take a stand for something, you've got to be standing on something pretty solid. Mm. You stand on your values um, and they have to be rock solid. Although, as you remember from that exercise, it it's not that easy. Um, and that is what allows you to, that's where you put your energy is in that stand, you know? And if you, well, you've seen it, I've seen it. People that are just so committed to their patients in the most authentic way that it's inspiring to, to all of us. And, uh, um, you know, this is the, um, this starts to get into professional identity. And as you know, there are some schools that are starting to work on that with their medical students. And what, what is your identity as a physician? What, where do you see your purpose? Where do you see your, your, your stand um, playing out? And until you get clear about all this stuff and are able to park the everything society says about you got to get promoted, you got to get tenured, you got to get grants. You, you, if you, you got to be able to see the, um, you know, the addictiveness of that, you know, and, 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 uh, um, um, it's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So our stand on solid ground, even when the earth beneath us is moving, when there's a fill in the blank, a global pandemic, when your institution is struggling with finances, when your department has new leadership, when you have a lot of turnover, all that earth shifting beneath our feet is unsteady. But if we personally are on solid ground that we can, we're not going to crumble because we have the ability to flex and pivot somewhat because our core is is solid. Yeah. That's the thinking. Yeah. And I think, and then to have people who are anchored like that, strongly anchored to, to share that with others and, to, you know, be the ones who say, look, I know all hell is breaking loose, but let, let's, let's reground. Uh, we have one another, you know, what, is the fundamental reason that we come to work each day, Mm. but you know, we're, we're, we're emotional creatures and, and everybody has a, I think uh, a certain size emotional plate, right? Some have a big plate, some have a little plate. And so part of, of being an effective leader is, is to kind of know how much heat people can take, how much heat can the organization take, you know, how much heat can, you know, can individuals take, because some can take more than others, they're, they're you know, uh, and to sort of titrate that as you introduce new initiatives, you know, well, here's what we got to do with the pandemic, here's what we got to do with, you know, with turnover, here's what we got to do with this or that, it, it, you got to titrate that and recognize that part of being human is there's only so much people can take, you know, I remember reading uh, some of of Lincoln, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's memoirs. And, you know, he, he came to the conclusion um, that the, the, that um, at the beginning of the civil war, that, that people were dealing with so much that to, uh, initiate the Emancipation Proclamation at that time more than people could handle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, you know, that requires enormous sort of wisdom and um, the the real substance of being a a very, very effective leader, you know, to, to, to pull that off in in an organization. It's, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it sounds like you're talking, I, I can envision this, like you're managing the energy emission. Yes. So like yes. That, that would be a lot of 
energy to absorb. I'm thinking almost like superhero Marvel comics kind of thing. That's a big blast of energy versus learning how to maybe laser focus and when you can, yeah. when you can um, go big and when you need to kind of pull back some of that, put a filter on your energy. Yep. <laughs> I think that's very well said, Kim. And, and, you know, it brings up this idea that, um, you know, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transmuted. And uh, there's nothing to me more inspiring than to see, watch somebody who uh, is able to transmute, change the negative energy that people are bringing to the table into positive energy. Um, and to me, that's a sign of, of people that are very, very... Yeah sort of in touch and uh, aware of, of life itself. And it's, yeah. Profound stuff. Dr. Chip Shoba. Now you know why he's on this podcast. Wasn't this inspiring and just a genius. Thank you so much for sharing all these insights about the journey, the inward journey and reminding us of taking a stand and, um, this has just been wonderful. Any parting thoughts for our audience, Chip? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that I I uh, was told years ago, and it's uh, it, it it's something we I find I always have to keep in mind is as you go through life, it's very helpful to have a a loose relationship, a, a, an even a detached relationship with this thing called me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because if you take that thing too seriously, it's going to get you into trouble. <laughs> I love it. That is so good. And when you started saying, uh, as you go through life, I couldn't help but remembering some meme as you go through life, no matter be your goal, keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the hole. That's right. That's <laughs> That's great. That's great. I'm hungry. I'm, I guess I'm thinking of donuts. Dr. Chip Showbug, just so wonderful. I love talking with you. And it reminds me of how important it is to seek out um, the leaders who, who have just been here, seen it all, done it all. Um, thank you so much again for being on the podcast. Folks, if you want to be in the podcast or you know someone who we should have on the podcast, please send them my way via Faculty Factory Kim at gmail.com. That's facultyfactorykim at gmail.com. Again, Dr. Chip Shoba, thank you so, so much. Thank you, Kim, for and thank you for, you know, being the host of this uh, wonderful podcast. Uh, I wish you the best. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.